Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Get to Know the Winds. Um, I appreciate you joining us on this, uh, what is a cold Asheville morning, finally, and on uh, Thanksgiving week. I know a lot of you are probably at home getting ready for, um, hopefully, family gatherings um, with some yummy food. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute for our participants to come in. Um, I'll go ahead and let you know that um, my name is Amanda Bullroth, for you, those of you that are watching that um, do not know. Um, I will be hosting this morning. Um, unfortunately, Darfa will not be able to join us. Um, and I also apologize for anybody that saw an email that went out this morning. Um, for some reason, our MailChimp decided to copy over um, a subject line from, from the other week. Um, so I apologize for that if there was any confusion there. Um, either way, we're glad that you're here with us and it looks like we've got some participants, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, well, to, to start this um, ASO at home off, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists, our wonderful panelists that have joined us. Um, I would just like for you to let us know your name, how long you've been with the Asheville Symphony, your instrument, um, maybe something fun about yourself, um, whatever you'd like our audience to know, I'm going to leave the floor open to you. Um, let's go ahead and start with you, Michael. Oh, sure. Hello, <laughs> everybody. Um, my name is Michael Burns. I'm the principal bassoon in the Asheville Symphony and have been in the orchestra, <laughs> I think, 11 or 12 years. I can't quite remember, um, but but uh, certainly more than more than 10. And I am also the bassoon professor at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, so I commute up to play with Asheville, and actually you're going to find as we go around the room that, that many of us commute from various distances. Um, Amanda takes the cake, uh, Amanda Lebrecht takes the cake for, for uh, this group, but um, I get to stay with some wonderful hosts while I'm here in, in Asheville and, and really enjoy my time coming up um, in pre-COVID days when we were actually doing such things. Um, <laughs> Let's see, I can't remember what, what else I was supposed to say. Um, so basically, um, yeah, I've been playing in the, the orchestra for a while. You might tell that I don't have exactly a North Carolina accent. So I'm originally from New Zealand and um, have been uh, here in North Carolina. This is my 26th year teaching at UNCG. So I've been in North Carolina um, quite a long time and in the US about 30 years now. Um, that might be my fun fact. I guess another one that, that surprises some people is that uh, back in the dark ages, um, I used to be a jazz and rock drummer. Oh, wow. Do you still endeavor in that at all? Um, I don't own a kit or anything anymore, but there have been a, infrequent occasions that I will, will uh, join in. I, I play in a, a um, contemporary ensemble and at times have joined in the percussion section for one thing or another so i'm rather rusty at it but i still can i can i can keep time i can still do some things i just can't do the fancy <laughs> things that i used to be able to do anymore. whenever they need an emergency percussionist you're there yep, i'm there yep wonderful well thanks michael um let's go ahead to amanda who is also a, a special guest with her <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to get her to uh, chill out for a little bit so She'll, I'll let her make an appearance at some point here. Um, so I'm Amanda Lebrecht. I've been with the Asheville Symphony for um, 13 years, I think, so since about 2007. So, Michael, I know you were there before me, so it's longer than 13 years for you. Okay. <laughs> um, but I play um, third oboe and English horn. And um, not French horn, not as to be confused with French horn. English horn is a woodwind, not a brass instrument. Um, <clears throat> so um, I live out in Raleigh, so I, um, I do commute all the way out to Asheville. Um, and it's become kind of my sort of respite away from, from normal life. I have um, three kids, six, three, and um, now three weeks. And... Um, so it's kind of become like my vacation. It's like, I'll go out to Ashman, I'll be like, oh, it's amazing. I don't have kids with me. They're usually at home with my husband or with my parents. And um, I just can go out, play, enjoy being around with people, have like an adult evening, which is so refreshing. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and um and then you know get back to normal life afterwards but um yeah I just I've absolutely loved playing with Asheville um symphony over the past 13 years it's been really it's been fun it's been really fun and we have such a great group of people um I feel like we all especially in the wind section like all of us really get along very very well and it's so nice because you don't often get that in a symphony setting so Mm. (laughs) um yeah I don't know about any necessarily fun facts about me um maybe something slightly embarrassing. I was a cheerleader in high school (laughs) and in college. (laughs) Um, Something I'm proud of, but it definitely, you know, people will be like, oh, you're so bubbly. I'm like, yes, well, there is a reason for that. (laughs) That's a positive thing. I know, right? (laughs) So, um, and uh, yeah, I think that's about it. That's good. Thanks for sharing, Amanda. All right, and last but not least, we have Shannon Thompson. Shannon, you go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm the bass clarinetist in the Asheville Symphony, and I have been the bass clarinetist in the Asheville Symphony since 1998, which was my second year in North Carolina. I came here in 1997 uh, to take the job as clarinet professor at um, Western Carolina University, and I am still there as the clarinet professor many years later. And um, I have, uh, Asheville is like a second home to us because we're not that far away, you know, in Colowee. And um, and I've been, um, uh, uh, is, uh, serving the Asheville Symphony with with Chip and Karen Hill uh, <laughs> for all those years, um, and uh, we really are a family. You know, I mean, they are just the most wonderful people. The whole wind section, uh, just wonderful group of people uh, uh, to work with. Um, okay, mm. I totally forgot what the rest of your questions were. It's okay. Um, <laughs> well, the, the fun fact that everybody had had a fun time with, but. Um, so yeah, if you just want to, if you fun fact about yourself, fun you fact. Did, oh my gosh, do you have okay. any other instruments that you be with? Well, uh, what these ones back here? Not yeah. really. <laughs> 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 I actually, I, I play. I um, okay. I I'm sort of a serial hobbyist, you know. <laughs> and so I go through things, and so I have this ukulele craze back here, bass craze back here. Someday I'll learn those instruments. Um, I actually just packed away. Uh, my, uh, well, not mine, but uh, the school's bassoon, oboe, saxophone, and flute this morning because I teach woodwind methods. And, oh my gosh. And I, yeah, so I actually have some experience playing badly on, on all of those other woodwinds. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's, that's, that's quite a talent. And I think that that actually kind of gets into my second question that I was going to ask. And then at this point, I'm just kind of open up the floor, whoever wants to answer and we can go around again. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the special techniques needed to play a wind instrument. Um, Maybe for some of our viewers that don't know, um, maybe just like give a little, I don't know, small snippet of kind of what differentiates uh, a wind instrument from the rest of the orchestra. Um, and, and I know that there is definitely some special skills needed there. So um, whoever wants to take that question and run with it. Wow, that's what I teach every day. I'll let you take that <laughs> then, <Shannon. laughs> You know, it's interesting. That first word that you put in there, wind, that's what it's all about. Mm. Okay. Now that would, uh, that would also apply to brass instruments as well. But I find that so much of, of playing a musical line and everything really has to do with how we blow through the instrument. You know, the, the um, uh, it, you know, it means uh, it, it's, it's more than just, you know, how you form your lips, all this kind of stuff. It's, it, it has so much to do with, you know, using your air really well and using it as your voice, basically. Mm. Um, you know, as far as special skills, uh, I feel like just about everybody can develop those, mm. you know, things. It, it takes a lot of hard, crazy work uh, that I don't know if I had to do it over again, I would, you know, have that patience. But as a child, (laughs) (laughs) I really, yeah, enjoy practicing a lot. (laughs) Do you all normally suggest like 
you know, instruments to kind of start off with. If a child is like maybe interested in, in playing a wind instrument, you know, what, what is the, for example, like what is the youngest student you've ever had? I've always wondered that, 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 you know, the, the wind section kind of takes this special, you know, I've, so many kids start to learn the piano, you know, when they're three years old, every child can put their hand on keys, right? But I would think a wind instrument would take kind of some special instruction or skill. Maybe I'm totally wrong there, but I'd be interested to hear kind of what your take is on that and what, what are the youngest students that you all have had? As far as the, the youngest students, um, it might be the same for Shannon, I'm not sure, but you know, being a college teacher, I don't actually tend to work with the right uh, beginner students so much unless i was teaching something like she was mentioning the the woodwind methods class where but even then you're working with college kids that are that are usually play a different instrument um so there are things you know there's the the suzuki string school and things like that and there is a version of that that includes the flute so i know of flute players that will start even at four or five years old wow. um it would be pretty darn um, unusual to find um, particularly bassoon or oboe that is very young. I mean, bassoon, there's the physical size of it. What mm -hmm. they're starting to do now, though, is that they're bringing back, you know, um, in the string world, they have these different sized versions of instruments. So you can buy a three quarter size violin or a one quarter size violin for a very young player so that they don't have, have the same stretch that they would as a, um, uh, a older child or especially an adult. And there are actually, there were from the Renaissance period, a number of different sized bassoons. And interestingly enough, in the 21st century, essentially, maybe very late 20th century, th those have started to come back. So that we now have some mini bassoons that are um, pitched at, at a higher level. The smallest one, which is a about like a normal bassoon is in the vicinity of four feet long when it's fully assembled, assembled. Mm -hmm. and the mini bassoon is about a little less than two feet long I mean it's similar to the size of a clown oh, wow. or an oboe and it can be played by a much younger child and that's been particularly um, taking wing again in Europe and in Asia and it's just sort of starting to take off in the US as well but um, clarinets there are you know they very much still have the different size instruments but i've never heard anybody saying give a child an e-flat clarinet and that would be, that would be <laughs> don't give anybody an e-flat clarinet <laughs> I know. um and there are there are different sized oboes of course amanda plays the english horn which which is you know one of the larger of the family but there doesn't seem to be the same level of smaller lighter cheaper instruments that are available for the students to play so that often becomes a little bit of a barrier to that hmm. oh here we go we, we're going to size comparison <laughs> oh. nope she's going to play the e-flat clarinet for us or something oh look so, at that definitely yeah. smaller but there, there are still issues that a, a younger child um with with um all of our instruments at least has to face in terms of just being able to cover the the holes Mm. Um, with, with if their fingers are small and the 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 breathing the wind that Shannon was talking about so you can see wow. that the size difference was Shannon there with the <laughs> sizes of clownets um, the the wind that we're using I sometimes talk to my students that we have to become athletes of breathing mm. like everybody breathes but we have to do it in a much more specialized way. That's like saying everybody runs, but if you look at an Olympic runner, they're obviously much more skilled and highly trained and really have honed in on what those muscles will do and what they need to do in order to run at that level. And we essentially have to do that with our breathing in order to play the music because we sustain long phrases and we have to play in tune and we have to make different dynamics louder and softer as well as the musical expression, as well as playing all of the different notes with the fingerings and things. So there's, there's a lot involved in doing that. So for me at least, um, more often than not, a bassoonist has actually started on a different woodwind instrument. Or, okay, or that's what I was gonna not ask, wood, yeah. Not a, sometimes not a woodwind instrument. Like I, I've got one of my current students started on trumpet and realized that was not for her. 
um, and you know bassoon was the switch but it's fairly common that it will be somebody that played the flute or the clarinet or the saxophone in particular quite unusual but i have had somebody switch from oboe to bassoon um, mm. but um the double How reads, dare they? i know, I know. <laughs> the double reads tend to be something that is you know some like about the youngest that i have worked with is maybe 12 or 13 years old and that's mm. fairly young for a double reed player um so anyway i would say because um since i since i don't teach at a college level i actually do get a lot of the beginner oboes um early on and so sorry <laughs> so, so um yeah sorry so um yeah so i get a lot of the beginners early on and most of the time we have them switching from clarinet or flute um and they're usually switching around um middle school typically mm -hmm. not elementary school i was actually very unusual in that I didn't switch from anything to oboe. I actually started on oboe after having played piano, you know, early, early on. So I started oboe at, um, in, gosh, what was that? I think it was like third grade. So oh, I was wow. like, what, nine, I think maybe. Um, and I think I've had like maybe one or two students who have started on oboe, but that's, seems to be very rare. Most band directors don't want to touch or deal with an oboe player <laughs> in the elementary school age. It is much more complicated. In some ways, I wonder if it would have been easier on for me when starting um, to have started on a different instrument, only because with oboe, there's so much, like Michael said, going on with your embouchure, like as a double reed, you have two variables that you're trying to make work. Whereas with clarinet, you've got you know, the ligature or the, the mouthpiece, and then you've got the single read. So you've got just the just the one variable and then one constant. Right, okay. You know, so, um, and so, and I remember honestly, whenever I started out on oboe, I mean, my parents and I had battles and arguments all the time about me practicing. Cause I was like, it's so hard. I don't want to go play. <laughs> and my dad was like, you're, I'm paying for this instrument. You are going to go practice, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's it's really challenging um but i feel like if you have if you have a student that's like just kind of a very naturally driven person they can easily start on you know they can they can take on the challenges that a, that a double read would possess and and handle it fairly well as long as they continue to have that drive that internal motivation but um yeah starting on on, on a double read is definitely challenging. And and I would say like from oboe to English horn, there are definitely differences um, because when you're in high school, like you usually don't get introduced to English horn until probably high school age. Mm. Um, and so often it's usually the New World Symphony by Dvorak that's your, that's your kind of intro to English horn, which is almost just like, it's so cruel. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, the interesting thing, though, is like, so the fingerings are all the same from oboe to English horn with a couple modifications as you get into some of the really high notes. Um, but what people don't explain to you is the amount of air differentiation between oboe and English horn. So with oboe, since we have such a tiny reed and there's so much back pressure, you usually have to get rid of a lot of air um, before you take another breath. Hmm. With English horn, you still have that, but to a much less, you know, intense degree. So you're constantly like giving off, giving out, giving out, giving out. And you're just like, oh my God, I'm, so, I'm exhausted. Like this instrument just takes so much more air. And so it's kind of one of those, like, I probably feel like I didn't really even master English horn or, well, even to this day, but, um, but feeling like I really had a good grasp on it until after I was already in Asheville Symphony, I think. Cause it wow. was just, it was just like, there's so, there's such a, a larger learning curve for like taking on an instrument that does require more air whenever you're not, you, it's like, oh, I can get by on not having to use all my air on oboe. Yeah, just kidding. Now you're playing wow. in the store. There's a whole different animal. So, um, 
And I saw somebody actually commented, why is the oboe used to sound yeah. the A in the orchestra? Yeah, um, I just wanted to answer that really quick. It's always been, my instructors have always informed me that the um, oboe is probably the most unstable of instruments, at least earlier on. And so the reason that they use the oboe to tune the orchestra is because once the oboe finds its pitch center, good luck getting the rest of the, I mean, like, you know, good luck getting an oboe to tune to everybody else, you know. That's why everybody tunes to the oboe. <laughs> I heard that too, so I am glad somebody asked that. <laughs> Michael may have a different reaction or <laughs> different answer to that. Yeah, so all of the rest of us curse the oboe. Uh, no, uh, uh, I think I've heard different stories about why the oboe gives the A. I mean, um, there have been some relating to um, that actually about stability in the opposite direction like they they can, oh. they can they can play the a and then they just sort of hang out there and everybody can um find it and i think it might actually relate a little bit to what amanda was talking about that that oboists with all of the back pressure that that um and the very small tube that they're putting the air through um therefore can actually s sustain a note, not necessarily yes. an in tune note, but a note for a, <laughs> for a fairly long period of time because the 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 amount of air being being used at a, at any one time is smaller than some of the larger instruments, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, in that regard, it gives people time to hear where the note is. But I do not envy them that <laughs> task at all. I, I think everybody else is very glad that we're not the ones that have to provide <laughs> the tuning note because it's it's very stressful. Um, I have to say, we had, we, I had like almost an entire college course on how to tune an orchestra and give an A. I mean, it was just, it's, Whoa. it's a lot, it's a lot. Cause yeah, I mean, you're, you're definitely, you have to, you talk about, okay, so you have to have enough warm up time before you, you know, actually give the A so that you know where your read is going to sit, you know how your embouchure needs to be. But at the same time, it's like, okay, so you need to make sure that what you give, it has to be in tune from the start pretty much with very little wiggle room and then once you get it you need to hold it and you need to keep the air consistent you can't add vibrato although i know some uh, some people do add vibrato but you're not we're not uh, it's uh, i've always been taught you're not really supposed to um and uh yeah it's just it's like an, it's a whole thing because even just getting it to start at the when you want it to start first of all let's talk about i mean you know it's not always sometimes you get false starts you know uh, there it is. Okay, you know, <laughs> um, and so how to just how to combat all of the possible different scenarios and that playing one single note consistently every single time can possess like all of those problems that could possibly arise. It's just yeah, and, crazy. And they may well be aware that if when they play the note, if if somebody else in the orchestra thinks that that note is right is not in the in the correct place they're like looking and checking their own tuners and going is, is the oboe right how why are they giving us a sharp a or, or flat my favorite or is, is my favorite is when you get the string players that kind of do one of these <sighs> As they kind of like turn around there. and look at you <laughs> <laughs> there was also the, the, the great question asking if recorder is, um, some of the recorder family is good for people to start with and and Shannon already said yes it is and, and one of the there, there are a couple of things about that 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 are particularly useful is it has the range of sizes they're very readily available and, and a cheap you know plastic recorder is extremely inexpensive yeah and most of our, many of our instruments, the fingering system that we used, if you go back far enough in the development of the instrument, was based on more or less the same fingering system that recorders use. So there's a there's a fair amount of, of transfer. That's an oversimplification, but but it, you know there are things that if you learn to play the recorder, then there's a number of things that would transfer over. You are learning to use your ear, but. One of the things that people do find uh, when I've had people that have switched from recorder is some of the what uh, um, Amanda was talking about, the amount of air pressure when they start playing, especially a reeded instrument like our, all three of us play, um, is going to be a lot higher pressure required than any recorder does. And so that can be a real adjustment for some people. 
Well, and especially if you have, I feel like recorder, even if you try to put more air through it, it's, you're getting a whole nother octave. (laughs) Yeah. So it's just, it really kind of does train you to use as little air as possible, which can be a problem. But fingering wise, it's very, it's, it is similar to oboe in that regard. Yeah. It's basically an end blown flute. Yeah. Uh, that has control over the sound uh, versus a flute, which is the trick with a flute is, is getting the direction exactly right uh, for air, uh, which can be, uh, which can be very challenging. Uh, well, now I'm going to go to a totally different direction. One of, I'm going to get into it a little earlier today um, than we normally do. One of our favorite questions of, of, for our attendees is, what is a piece of music composition that you all w- would like to play with Asheville Symphony that we've never done before? Uh, so I something? have to pick bass clarinet part, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I and it I doesn't have, I mean, it doesn't have to, yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to feature your instrument, but it, I would think that it would prob- probably would. Um, do you want to start, Shannon, or you need some time to think on that one? Uh, well, okay. There's a lot. Mm. You can, and, and you can go. We've got okay. time. You could go okay. in, in let, on let, this one. Let me just let no. Now let me just say that one thing that I haven't gotten to play, and I've, I, I'm in Hendersonville Symphony, and I have played there for a number of years as principal clarinetist. Um, mm, okay. And so I've, you know, played all the Beethoven symphonies, all the Beethoven, everything. Love it, you know, um, and et cetera. But one one thing that I haven't personally been able to play yet is the Brahms third symphony as principal clarinet okay Okay. and that is what i would like to play i know that sounds really everybody take like a conservative uh sort of choice you know um you know when we talk about bass clarinet i'm more like oh yeah more more strauss more stravinsky you know that kind of stuff you know um but but yeah that's what that's on my bucket list all right noted noted all right, Michael, Amanda, who wants to take it next? Uh, I, I can go. I, <laughs> okay. I would uh, love to play um, either the Shostakovich, Shostakovich fourth or sixth symphonies. Mm. I've played the fifth, I don't know how many dozen times, <laughs> but I've not played the fourth or the sixth yet. And I, and I, I love the pieces and, and um, would, would very much like to play them. And also, uh, Sibelius, I've played the second symphony a gazillion times, uh, and I've now played the fifth a couple of times, but there are several others of his that I'd be interested in doing as well. Mm. I feel like somebody mentioned that in, in one of our previous ones, but I'll have to go back and check the recording. We're definitely taking note of what these, what, what these <laughs> and Amanda, what do you got? Oh, I hesitate to say because our principal flautist, Lissy, uh, would probably shoot me. Um, I have yet to play um, the William Tell Overture mm. for, and the English. I just love the English horn part. I've played it for so many auditions and I just haven't had a chance to actually play it in concert setting. And um, actually Michael's wife, Carla, and I had a conversation about this back um, a little while ago. But yeah, I just I absolutely love that. And I'm I remember mentioning it once to Lissy that I was going to put it on our on our sheet of like, you know, suggestions or whatever. And she was like, don't you dare put that on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's that's probably my biggest bucket list. I've done I've done an awful lot of the English horn rep, fortunately, in the short period of time, I feel like that I've been playing professionally. So um, I feel like I've been fairly fortunate. And uh, I wish I I wish I knew more more like pared down pieces, like not full orchestral pieces, but maybe like chamber ensemble music mm. for, that includes English horn um, that I'm not as familiar with, unfortunately. So, well, and that actually leads me to my second question that I was going to ask, which is, you know, in this time of the pandemic, we've, we've been seeing a lot of um, orchestras having to and just players in general kind of going to this more chamber orchestra setting, which has its positives and you know you know i feel like it's bringing this re- the huge revival of chamber music um that was already there but i'm hoping this will this will bring it back even more um but what are some chamber music pieces that um that are your favorites that you enjoy playing um i just want to talk talk music now so 
Uh, Shannon okay. looks ready. <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. Okay, because I... Okay, so my favorite experience... We actually do play a lot of chamber music normally at right. Western Carolina, um, and th that's wonderful. Um, although we don't have... Uh, we don't have strings on the faculty, um, and and so that's a little different for us. So we have to bring string players in. And mm -hmm. um, my absolute favorite experience, chamber music wise, at uh, Western uh, was a few years back. We brought in some string players from the Asheville Symphony and played Schubert's Octet. Oh wow! Um, and I still, <laughs> to this day, just I you know I I. I, I just want to play Schubert's octet all the time. Um. <laughs> all right, I think we can make that happen. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you remember who the musicians were? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> it was us. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, I meant, I meant some meant some of the string string musicians. Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, and um, but. Uh, yeah, uh, but I don't I don't need to point people out, you know, because it's really right, right. experience of playing Schubert's, you know, Schubert's Octet. And actually, the three wind musicians in that group are members of the Asheville Symphony. Oh, wow. Um, Travis Bennett, uh, who plays horn, and, okay. and Will Peebles, who's uh, bassoon, often, I guess, contra bassoon. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That was, uh, anyway, that was that was a wonderful experience, and you know, there's so many things like I I haven't been able to do much with the you know there's some good clarinet um, uh, clarinet um, uh, and strings repertoire um, right. uh, Mozart Weber and uh, um, and Brahms all wrote really excellent uh, quintets, and there's plenty more really great stuff from the 20th century as well. And mm -hmm. uh, I haven't been able to explore that so much, although I've had a lot of good experiences performing with like maybe one, uh, you know, a cellist and a violinist, violist, you know, there's some great repertoire for that. And and I, I, I just feel like the clarinet in particular has some really beautiful uh, chamber music, uh, especially from the romantic era. Um, mm. Well, maybe maybe some of our um, our viewers will listen to some of that explore listen and explore some of that music over the holidays. I know I probably will. So, I've ne I personally never listened um, to some of the ones you mentioned. So now I'm interested. Mm. Yeah. All right, who wants to go next? Who's got who's got some burning answers? Well, I already said I don't really yeah, know a lot of chamber yeah, music yeah, for English yeah. horns. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that has not been, unfortunately, something that I've gotten a chance to really delve into. So I feel like that requires my own personal, uh, you know, footwork, <laughs> trying to find, like find and, and figure out what it is that, that yeah. I like. Uh, and I've had um, a lot of great opportunities to do chamber music um, in various assorted um, uh Preformed typical ensembles like uh, uh, wind quintet is the the most common. Um, there are a number of wind serenades that are often an octet of instruments with a pair of horns, clarinets, bassoons, and oboes. Um, and I've gotten to do most of the major rep for that combination. There are other interesting mixed groups um, as well. One of my all-time favorite pieces is the Stravinsky octet which has two bassoons, uh, two tr uh, trumpets, two trombones, clarinet, and flute. And mm. um, apparently the instrumentation came to him in a dream, uh, but it's, a, it's an awesome piece, uh, really fantastic. And things like the, the um, Schoenberg um, Chamber Symphony, which is, when people hear the name Schoenberg, they maybe recoil a little bit thinking of, of, of some of his, his more... Um, um, modernistic style of music and particularly with the serial but this is actually like it's almost in the style of that we might think of like Richard Strauss it's very very lush romantic and really amazing and very difficult work that I did when I was quite young and I'd like to revisit at some point um, to play again it's not that not he actually wrote two of them and they're not done very often um, I've been lucky we've done things like the soldier's tale um, here um, and some other ensembles of that sort that are, that are really great pieces of music and, and, and somewhat eclectic with, with uh, instrumentation and things of that sort. 
I have gotten to do a number of pieces with strings. Um, one that I really liked in that that um, has actually been getting some um, attention again recently, maybe especially in, li in terms of people assessing repertoire choices and there's, there's been a, a move since the, all of the racial reckoning that has been mm. occurring recently to think about underrepresented composer groups. And um, yeah. I've done a, a non-et by um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, African-American composer, right. wow. wonderful, wonderful piece. And it's almost never heard. I actually uh, played a recording of it. And several people lately have been contacting me saying they found it and they enjoyed it. And where can they find the music? And it's unfortunately very difficult to find. Um, but I, I, I would be very interested in exploring more of the underrepresented composers. Um, throughout music history, there have been a number of women composers that were, were marginalized or mm -hmm. even where they may have been married to somebody more famous or had a brother or sister that was more famous mm -hmm. and in, at times the music was was at, uh, attributed to the male wow so the clara schumann's and the and yeah. and the um uh um Nanuel mozart and the um help me out guys i'm, I'm fanny I'm, fanny I'm, Hensel. yes fanny mendelssohn yeah. and mm -hmm. and several other people that uh, we're pretty darn sure we're very accomplished composers in their time, but nobody really hears their music. Mm -hmm. And of course, to the present day, looking at at musics by um, by women, by by people of, of assorted gender identity, should I say, mm -hmm. uh, by different ethnic and different cultural things, because in the classical world, there was a question I saw about, you know, uh, in the question and answer part, yep. um, mm -hmm. asking about non-classical genres. And, and one of them I would say that is, is very important and, and, and that I must say proudly that the Asheville Symphony has been doing already is to look at musics written by, that are not written by white male European composers. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's from another culture or whether it is from from um, you know different different bases um, of one sort or another, and that will include some chamber music, but also at times some of the full orchestral pieces. But there's been a, a real move in academia, um, in the music side of things, but also in other disciplines to decolonize mm. and to really be aware of the white male privilege that that exists. And so, you know, we have to walk this line between the, the earlier questions, what repertoire would you like to do? And we're naming these white male European composers uh, mm. primarily. Um, and, and there are these, these um, masterpieces and chestnuts in our, in our repertoire. And I think we need to, to still pay homage to them and they need to still be played. But making sure that, that there's also representation of some of the other groups that have not really had had as much exposure and I think people will find there's a lot of music to be found out there that is in different genres um, again going back to my my interesting fact about myself with the the, the jazz and the rock I mean other non-classical genres that I'm very comfortable with are things that that um, are in, in the rock and the jazz vein but I've also been um, lucky to work in a lot of new music and work with composers from other um, cultures, things like that. I actually have mm. been teaching this semester at UNCG a, a class where everybody has to play music that is after um, was written after 1965, and there are well. several Chinese students in the in the class, and and most of them ended up gravitating towards a composer that is Chinese born, but in many instances is, is doing some sort of hybrid with Chinese and Western musics together and playing it on a Western instrument. I think all three of them are violinists. And, and um, then we, we would have discussions in the class about how some elements of it would seem to be as if it was representing one of the traditional Chinese instruments, the erhu or the pipa or something of that sort. And that also one of them had elements of um, Peking opera 
mm. coming out in this piece for violin and that, you know so that some realization of the the global music world as opposed to the european yeah music world. Mm -hmm. i think that that's kind of where it starts you know i heard a lot the growing of the audience or expanding the audience or um you know breaking down those barriers in the audience but you really have to start with music right i mean you have to make sure that the, the music is is um drawing that type of audience or even interest you know that you can see yourself you know as a, a lot brought up female co co you know composers as a female i think the other females on this call could say the same where it's like you know our whole life we've been playing white music written by white male men most of the time and yeah. um it is such a breath of fresh air when you know you get to play something that's outside of that so what do you what did you have to say shannon i i just okay well okay this whole covid thing <laughs> happened at a really tough time for me because uh it was a uh, a week uh a week before i was about to do uh my first recital of all women composers oh wow uh with lillian pearson and um and you know i'll be honest with you there's okay this has been a very tough year for me um i lost my mother um you know i know you want to keep things upbeat but no that's <laughs> you know, okay this is nice uh, and and uh you know my 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 dad's moved into assisted living so there's you know a lot of things that we've been dealing mm -hmm. with the family and everything and so i you know i'm trying to get my way back to to playing more um uh, uh, you know um but I, but uh, you know, during this time, during the last couple of years, uh, uh, with um, with this newfound, you know, awakening about women, you know, and I feel like, especially, you know, I feel like women of my generation didn't. I don't think we really realized, uh, you know, uh, just how much we were sort of playing into this male dominated world, et cetera, mm. you know, and I still, you know, I still have this mindset, you know, as I was telling you when I'm talking about my favorite chamber pieces, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, I'm, I, it is real white male centered, et cetera. You know, this is how I was educated. Right. Um, but I've, I, you know, I've really tried to break out of this and I find that for myself, how I've been able to do this, um, because, um, uh, you know, besides playing more contemporary music by living composers that, uh, you know, are not, you know, white male, European, whatever, uh, uh, um, uh, is to take pieces from other instruments and transcribe mm. them if they're appropriate for my instruments, clarinet mm. or bass clarinet. And so um, I transcribed... Uh, I transcribed a, a, a short piece for cello and um, piano that Fanny Mendelssohn had uh, written for her other brother, Paul, to, for her, uh, who was a cellist and a banker, uh, you know, to, to play. And uh, I play that at um, uh, the Clarinet Fest, International Clarinet Fest uh, uh, in uh, 2019. And and uh, and this uh, this next year I'll be doing a uh, a recital at the next clarinet fest of Lillian uh, Lillian um, Nadia Boulanger Nadia Boulanger was a really famous um, actually the most famous composer uh, I mean excuse me teacher of composers ever mm -hmm. okay um, was a woman okay just uh, and and mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, um, um, amazing teacher and also she did do some composing more earlier in her life her her sister died early was uh, uh the first composer to win um the uh the top prize at the paris conservatory um and um and so i've taken some of their music and transcribed it for clarinet bass clarinet and piano and um and I'm also actually before I was uh, uh, before COVID, and we're rescheduling a recital. Probably, uh, you know, this is hard because uh, because when we do a recital and we're on stage and we've got aerosols coming out of our instrument, we have to be careful about if we're playing with another person. They have to be masked. You know, we can only be in a room for so long, etc. But um, I, you know, expect to reschedule this recital 
maybe in a series of recordings, I'm not really sure, where we're playing uh, Rebecca Clark's viola sonata transcribed to clarinet in A, which oh. is beautiful. And, you know, I whenever I play something for another instrument, I feel a little apologetic, <laughs> you know, because I know I am not a viola player and I can't do everything that a violist does, but I feel like I can, you know, if you, if you choose carefully with the pieces that you transcribe and and you really bring your heart and soul to them, you can find a way to really make that that, you know, help that piece uh, be available to more people, for one thing, you know, uh, and um, and, you know, be a new, a, you know, fresh. And so that's what I've been doing with my with my time, basically, musically. Mm. is is finding particularly women composers uh master works that that i love and mm. and uh, finding a way to play them on clarinet or bass clarinet well if and when that recording comes to fruition please keep us in the loop let us know oh, yeah. um we, we'd love to share that with everybody so wonderful well, and I guess I'll just go ahead. We've got John Condren who has um, asked two questions. Michael, you've already answered one part of the question, um, but he said, if ASO were to engage in non-classical music, what genres or types of music would you like to play? And two, you can answer one or both. If you could choose one instrument to play in the symphony other than what you currently play, what instrument would that be? Um, <laughs> Is Michael, go ahead. I was going to say, um, you know, a, a bucket list thing to, for me to play and remembering that I already have some of the percussion background, <laughs> I would love to play the bass drum in the Verdi Requiem. I've played every one of the bassoon parts multiple times and I love them and the first bassoon part's amazing, <laughs> but I want to play that bass drum part in the Verdi Requiem one day. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I, mean, I gotta know why. Oh, so I mean, other if, than if, the if obvious. you know the piece, the, the, yes. the bass drum features extremely prominently. So um, yep. there's there's this returning refrain uh, uh, that comes in where the um, there are these punctuated chords that is answered by like as loud as you can possibly hit at the bass drum. So the whole orchestra goes bum 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 bum, and and. Uh, the first time I saw it in New Zealand, the bass drum that they used, I think, was 12 feet across. And the player was using a two-handed mallet. And it was like a baseball bat with a, a giant thing on the end. And it was, so, it was like this visceral, you get this, you know, it, it was incredible. But then there's also, there's an aria later on with the bass where um, the, the low instruments go boom, 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 boom. And the bass drum goes boom. And it's just this incredible effect. And I, I'm like, I, I want to play that part one day. I'm going to play it. My nightmare. <laughs> yeah, don't be sitting in front of me if I'm playing it. So. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, I would probably have to say if I could choose any other instrument, it would I would be similar to Michael in that I have always been obsessed with percussion in general. Like I just love rhythm. I love percussion. I love anything having to do with rhythm. And um, in fact, I wanted to be a percussionist so badly when my parents first asked me, you know, like after coming home from this elementary school, you know, petting zoo of, of instruments and all that kind of stuff. They're like, what do you two choose? What do you want to play? And I was like, I want to play percussion. And my mom was like, no, choose again. So, <laughs> so they just wanted nothing to do with that. And so I was like, all right, fine. So I, you know, it ended up on, on oboe eventually, but I just, that whole like rhythmic aspect has never left me to this day. Like I just absolutely love complex, crazy rhythms. And I just would absolutely love being in a percussion section. Um, and then as far as like non-classical music, I don't know if this necessarily pertains, but I, I love opera, which mm. I just love opera music. And fortunately with um, Winston-Salem Symphony, we have the Piedmont Opera that we get to do two operas each season. And it's just like, oh, I don't know what it is about. I do well, I do know what it is about opera. I like that you have the lyrics and that you, it really gives you more of a true sense of exactly where, what you're emoting. Um, 
instead of some sometimes whenever we have symphonic music it's like you have to really dig back into the history of the piece and what was the composer thinking of at the time and all that kind of stuff and sometimes it's nice to have opera where it's like the person is feeling x y and z let's go with that <laughs> um but just some of the so much of the passion and like and playing off of the the singers like i love um and i'm so bad at recollecting names and and um pieces but we played a an opera a couple years back in winston and there was this gorgeous um solo that the baritone was singing and then the English horn was playing off of it. And just to be able to like have the singer on stage doing their thing. And then for me to respond to it, mm -hmm. like as like this duet, it was just like, oh, I love this. It's so great. So I don't know. Opera for me is, I just absolutely love opera. And some of my students probably can't stand that I love opera because so many of our oboe etudes and stuff that we go over, I'm like, this is so operatic. You need to do more of this. You know? I'm like, like a love-hate relationship, love-hate <laughs> relationship kind of thing. I'm, I'm an opera singer. And so I certainly, you know, people are either like, I love opera. People are like, I can't stand that. <laughs> That's awesome. I think sometimes people have to grow into opera too. Yes. At least I did. Uh, to to appreciate it more um i i love playing any uh any popular genre type of music uh just just trying to figure out it's a lot of times it's really rhythmic you know trying to figure out the you know uh and i i don't know so basically anything throw me anything you know? <laughs> <laughs> i in fact in fact when i think of some of my best experiences in Asheville symphony uh, a lot of it has been like jazz pieces you know <laughs> jazz influence pieces jazz type pieces you know mm. yeah oh, i would say jazz for sure is one yeah. of my all-time favorites except oh yeah you know what oboe player plays jazz music half the time uh, the the there's yeah. like that Yusuf Latif or whatever, but like, <laughs> you know, I mean. It works, it works. It, it does work sort of, but like, <laughs> we're talking like like big band jazz. I'm like, yeah. there's no oboe there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to say I have a leg up on you. A <laughs> little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Did we wanna talk about the, the other question that Kathy yeah. and George asked? Yeah. Um, you guys can go first. I just didn't want that to get missed. That's all. What was the question? It says, I've heard oh. that A keeps moving up in frequency, for example, 432 oh, to 440 yeah. over a few decades, et cetera, et cetera. I'm totally against that. Okay. It makes everything too bright sounding. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. 440, 438, something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, um, though, when they're talking about the 432, you're talking more, more along the lines of, of Baroque pitch. And so uh, if somebody's playing on, on um, usually replicas of period instruments, then they will, will, the instrument will be designed to be playing at a certain pitch level. So you can't take a Baroque oboe and, uh, pitched in 432 and, and make it play at 440. It just it, it won't work. So over the the years as the pitch um level has has uh risen and then the sort of the the uh, international agreement if you will that 440 was the basis then the instrument makers have made um uh, design changes accordingly and and literally the instruments have 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 um changed the placement of the tone holes and the and the bore configuration and other things in order to make them conform but part of what shannon is talking about is that um, a number of orchestras particularly in europe will play at a equals four, 444 or 446 um, and if that's the case they're taking the instruments that are for all intents and purposes the same as ours again an oversimplification but the, the way that maybe particularly their reeds are set up and other things about how they play it are putting it at the higher pitch. And part of that is that people um, feel that it adds more sparkle to the sound and things of, of that sort. But it, it, it's, it's a real, um, there are different orchestral um, um, conventions. And, and even, you know, we were talking before about the, the oboe giving the A 
But uh, what we all know, all of us uh, that, that play in a group know, is that no matter where the A is played by the oboe, by the end of rehearsal, it's quite likely that the, that, that the orchestra, or at least portions of it, will be in a quite different place than, than was given. And usually that's higher. Mm. You guys agree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would say too, like even even still, like like um, I think New York Feld is at like what four forty two, or some four forty one, four forty two. And I know like even when you're preparing like for an audition or something like that, and the orchestra will send you a, a list of the rep that you have to prepare, and then they'll also say the orchestra has pitched at you know four forty two or whatever. Um, as an oboe player, making a read when you're so accustomed to playing at 440 and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, we have to make this read sharper, which means I need to make the read shorter, which means that then I've got less tip or less heart or everything needs to be sh moved, adjusted. Like, so you've got, um, yeah, you've got different, like if uh, my reads are all in the case over there, but um, um, if you have a read, you've got different parts to the read. So you've got like the tip and then you've got like the heart and then down by the thread, you've got, the back. And so if you start to mess with too many of those dimensions, you're either moving everything down so that the whole read is shorter, or you're taking off just at the tip, which then your higher partials don't want to come out, which means your higher notes don't want to pro play properly, and everything just starts to get really thrown off kilter. And it can be, I mean, I'm I'm not a personal fan. I mean, you know, you, you kind of have to do what you have to do in some instances, but at the same time, it's just kind of like, we just leave the pitch where it is. <laughs> but the other thing too is like, even if you, as, as a noble player, even if you prepare the A, okay, my A plays at a 442, but everything else may not necessarily want to agree with that. And that's the other thing that's tricky is like, if you're, at least with oboe, if you're preparing your read to play at 440, everything else will generally be in the approximate same area. But if you're trying to make one, that one note 442, you know, my C may still not want to be in that same pitch center. Um, so you, yeah, it's, yeah. it can be a, a real very pain. Very challenging for <laughs> equipment. It's, it's very frustrating. Um, just even going from 440 to 441, I find difficult. I tend to blow low on my instrument, and so I need a short barrel anyway, but, uh, but I have to actually uh, bring a special barrel that's cut down a millimeter or two shorter than this if I'm going to be going with a 442 pitch. Hmm. All right. Well, I think we got to all of our questions, and I know that we're, we've come to the, the conclusion. That was pretty fast, and um, again, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us, and Amanda, you want to introduce your little baby? This is, yeah, this is Heidi. Hi. She's She'll be three weeks old tomorrow. Oh, wow. And she's exhausted <laughs> from sleeping so much. <laughs> well, that is absolutely adorable. Yeah. Well, congratulations. And we and really appreciate you, you especially taking the time to, to join yeah. us. Um, no, this is great. It's nice to have adult conversation with other musicians. <laughs> <laughs> I know, actually, I mean, even though my students are technically adults, <laughs> it's nice to, to be here and not be in a faculty meeting right now. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, we miss all of you, and I know you all probably miss each other and miss being on stage. And, <laughs> Yeah. You know, as, as time goes, if you have anything that you would like to share um, with our audience about endeavors that you're working on or things that, you know, musical things that you're doing, we'd, we'd love to share that with them. And um, to our audience, if you have any other questions that we didn't get to this morning, please feel free to um, type those in the chat box, send us an email, and um, I'll see what I can do to, to get those questions for the along. So thanks again, everybody, and y'all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye.